Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michelle. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Beyond Keratoconus with the Oculus Penicam. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter questions. Enter your questions at any time, and we will discuss them at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speaker tonight is Dr. William Tulo. Dr. Tulo is a medical director of Oculus Inc. He has maintained a private practice in his hometown of Princeton, New Jersey since 1988. Bill was assistant clinical professor at SUNY College of Optometry from 1988 to 1997. He has a doctorate of optometry from the State University of New York College of Optometry and is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry since 1990 and a member of the American Optometric Association since 1984. In 2011, he was recognized by the American Academy of Optometry as diplomates in cornea, contact lens, and refractive technologies the the academy's highest honor i'm excited for tonight's presentation welcome dr tulo thank you michelle good evening everybody and thanks for uh tuning in on an evening uh wanted to talk tonight about the use of the penicam i know when i go visit most practices the majority of practices that have penicams only utilize five or ten percent of the potential of what a penicam to, can do and probably only utilize maybe two of the 15 to 20 displays that are, that are available for them to use so I wanted to talk about not just the typical use of the penicam but some other uses that you may or may not be familiar with so the penicam has actually four different models the basic model the HR model the AXL model and the AXL wave model uh, the things we're going to be talking about tonight um, can be done, some some of them only with the AXL Wave, but many of them with all of our different models. Um, and they're all based on the same technology of a rotating Schleinflu camera that uses monochromatic blue light with 138,000 true elevation points. So it's a very high resolution device. Um, and again, these images can be anywhere between one and two seconds in captures, depending on if you want to do 25, 50 images and the precision again and the reproducibility is, is quite remarkable. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the device itself. So what is most most people who have penicans, what do they use it for? They use it for keratoconus screening, but tonight's lecture is called Beyond Keratoconus. So we're gonna only spend a very few moments on the keratoconus use of the device. And these are the two displays that most people are familiar with with the penicam. It's the format refractive here on the left side and on the right side, the Bell and Ambrosio Enhanced Ectasia Display, or better known as the BAD. And these are the two most useful uh, screening displays when you're looking to see or rule out patients for refractive surgery or even before cataract surgery, just to let them get to know, is there anything going on in the cornea that may become a problem if you're doing a clear corneal incision um, or if you're doing any type of corneal refractive procedure. And what are you looking for? Again, most commonly, um, you're looking for keratoconus or, or an ectatic disease. And these are just three typical four map refractive maps. On the left, you see a very normal symmetrical map. Um, and you see here where uh, the, the anterior and posterior elevation are very symmetrical. Down below, you can see the, the uh, axial and uh, sagittal map, very symmetrical, and, and the pachymetry map, very uniform and symmetrical also. In the middle, you see, well, let's go all the way to the right. You see a frank case of keratoconus. You see the back elevation and the front elevation in the same location and the back elevation much greater than the front elevation. You see in this situation, the typical distorted Myers um, and this actual bare claw appearance and a very thinned out cornea. It's the cases where this technology really shines is those cases that are subclinical, meaning the patients still have 20-20 vision, um, they're not aware they have anything wrong with their eyes, but when you examine them, you'll see if you look on the back of their cornea, which is where most keratoconus begins, you see this island of elevation beginning to happen. And because this island of elevation has not proceeded to the front of the cornea, that's why the patients still have excellent best corrected vision and probably no awareness at all that they have an underlying condition that may lead to loss of vision in the future. What's so powerful about the, the, the uh, BAD display that differentiates the Penicam from any other instrument out there, and that's its normative database and enhanced regression analysis. So this device actually uses nine different parameters to dis decipher whether or not the risk of ectasia or abnormal cornea exists. 
Um, and here are the different nine parameters, which are not really important, but each parameter is weighted differently um, and it's weighted in such a way so we can tell with the final deregression analysis what the risk is. But making a diagnosis is never made just on a single map alone. Uh, number one, you always need to look at both eyes because, again, keratoconus is an asymmetric disease, but also look at acquired asymmetric corneal astigmatism. If you have old glasses, take a look at what their glasses prescription, how it's changed over time. And if one eye keeps increasing in astigmatism, that should, that should be a warning sign. If you have any subtle losses of best corrected vision or asymmetric best corrected vision by three letters or more, it's also a warning sign. When you look at your tomography, you can look at that front and back elevation and compare the two. We'll show you some examples in just a moment. Look at the pachymetric progression, how the cornea thickens from its thinnest point out to the limbus. And look at that regression analysis, that final D, very important. And we also look at the vertical coma. The vertical coma also can be indicative of early keratoconus screening. Here's a typical normal eye for map refractive. Again, you see everything looks beautiful and symmetrical. Uh, no islands on the front, no islands on the back, and the axial map looks perfectly symmetrical, and the corneal thickness map looks great. If we look at a suspicious map, here you see in the back of the cornea this significant island, and yet it has not broken out to the front. And that's, again, this patient, again, will have perfect vision. The cornea is a little bit thinner than normal, and there might be a little bit of inferior steepening, but a, a normal placido topographer would not indicate any signs of, of warning on this, and that's why looking at the back of the cornea is so important in detecting keratoconus. And here's a much more obvious case. Now you see in this moderate case of keratoconus, the back elevation has now become significant, 54 microns, and it's now breaking out into the front. You see over 20 microns on the front of the cornea. This patient will have loss of best corrected vision. They have significant inferior steepening on the axial map, and they have thinning on the corneal thickness map. So this one is pretty easy to diagnose. And again, when we look at these early attack changes, we can also use the topometric KC staging to determine at what uh, stage their keratoconus is. And it's based on an A, B, C, D a notation, A being the anterior radius of curvature, B, the posterior radius of curvature, uh, C, the corneal thickness, the thinnest point, and D is the best corrected vision or the loss of best corrected vision, which needs it to be typed in manually. And we can grade these patients on that A, B, C, D scale so we can watch over time and compare how things change over time. Uh, here's just another example of a much more severe keratoconus patient. And you see the staging here is way more significant where you have uh, uh, A3, B4, C3, D3. So very, very, very nice way to classify it. Um, much more specific and detailed than the old abzo like method of doing that, and just another case of advanced keratoconus. And these are the easy ones that you can diagnose uh, fairly easily. It's really the subtle cases. So what's, what's, more, uh, what's more advanced and what's new in the Penicamp? So now we have software that's specifically designed to determine if a, if a patient with keratoconus is progressing, even if a patient who has cross-linking is progressing, and we'll show you how this display works in just a minute. Um, but the way this works, it's the same ABC um, uh, depiction as we see uh, in the topometric KC staging display. But in the progression display, what we do is we display the maps over time. And you see this patient has three different maps. The, they have a yellow map, they have the green map, and uh, they have the blue map, which is the different, the older scan is the yellow, the next scan is the green, and you see the next scan in 2016 is the blue. So we can watch these ABC parameters change over time. And we also have uh, the, the uh, outline of these gates, which show us what stage the patient's in, and if they're, if they're proceeding past any of these gates. Now, the green gates that you see here, um, this is the normal uh, patient population. So if your patient doesn't have a diagnosis of keratoconus and you're just trying to see if they're progressing and trying to make the diagnosis of keratoconus, the green gates are the appropriate gates to use. And we have two gates in each color, the green 80 percentile normal population and the 95 percentile normal population. Um, in the red gates, the red gates is actually a database of, of keratoconic eyes. So it differs from the green normative database of normal eyes. And if we have a diagnosis of keratoconus, we want to use the red gates to determine if an eye is progressing or worsening. Um, so let's look at some examples. Here's an example of a patient um, also with three examinations. And if you look at their anterior radius of curvature, the A parameter, um, you can see here from each exam, it's gotten worse and, and it's actually proceeded to go right to the KC 80% gate. So 
we, we would like to see either two gates to proceed to 80% or one gate that proceeds to 95% to be totally confident that we have progression. Um, you can see in the back of the eye, we also see this progression to the 95 confidence interval of the green. So we have two parameters in green that are 95% confident, which would indicate that this patient is in this eye progressing and getting worse. Um, and we see here that uh, the corneal thickness, in fact, is, is getting thinner over time. So what are the blue gates? Well, the blue gates are the newest addition to the software. So we can now put the date of the cross-linking, and you can see this black stippled line here is actually the date the patient received cross-linking. And then one year after that date, the blue gates will pop up. And so you can now take subsequent measurements and tests and determine whether or not post cross-linking the eyes are stable and whether there may be a requirement for a second cross-linking procedure, which is not common, but again, it's very essential to continue monitoring your patient for progression even after they've had cross-linking. And now that we have these blue gates with this post cross-linking normative database, it helps us be a lot more specific uh, to know if they are indeed uh, getting worse or staying stable. Here's an interesting case of a 15-year-old with early keratoconus, and this is 13-month follow-up, and we can take a look at the three exams in this situation. On the anterior cornea, there really isn't any significant worsening over the three examinations, but the posterior cornea is clearly getting worse each, each examination. In fact, the uh, posterior cornea on the third examination far exceeds that 95 percentile. Um, the corneal thickness hasn't changed very much. And if we look at the K-max, and I blew out the K-max findings here, the K-max has really not changed at all. So from the old criteria of determining progression using K-max only, this child would not have been cross-linked. But if this is my child or my patient, I'm going to encourage cross-linking because this patient is clearly progressing. Even, and the fact that it hasn't broken to the anterior cornea and made K-max get worse or made visual acuity get worse, I think that's not a, that's not a good reason not to crosslink someone. I think this kid is get, clearly getting worse in this eye, and I would want to crosslink this kid as soon as possible just to prevent them from losing vision, which at 15 year old and the progression of this over the couple of years is clearly something that's a high risk for losing vision. Here's just one more example of a patient. How you this is how you put the added crosslink treatment in. You simply hit add new crosslinking treatment type in the appropriate date, and once you do that, the blue gates will appear. And as soon as an examination appears 12 months after that date of cross-linking, you'll start to see the examinations appear on this graph. So I promise you the title was Beyond Keratoconus, so I'm gonna go past now, and want to talk about a lot of other anterior segment conditions that can, uh, the that the penicant can be utilized to measure. So let's look at another form of atasia that's just a variant of keratoconus and it's pellucid marginal degeneration. And the pentacam is uniquely positioned for us to help diagnose this condition also. The difference between pellucid marginal degeneration and keratoconus is simply the location of where the thinning point is in pellucids. The thinning point is one to two millimeters by the inferior limbus down at 12 o'clock. And you can see on this diagram, this is a classic pellucids where you see the anterior elevation is very, very steep down bottom and the posterior is even worse in this patient, 160 microns of elevation. And you can see the classic uh, bear claw or kissing doves um, where you see this cornea folding in an orthogonal fashion. And one of the clinical characteristics that's unique with pellucids is different from keratoconus is pellucids patients can often have six, seven, eight, ten doppers of astigmatism, but the astigmatism, because the thinning is right down at six o'clock, typically the astigmatism is orthogonal and these patients often can refract close to 2020, whereas a patient with 10 doppers a cylinder with keratoconus would have many lines of loss of best corrected vision because of the non-orthogonal irregular astigmatism they would have. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, other displays that are not often not utilized that I think are really wonderful. I mean, this is the Schleinflug display. You can look at the pellucids and you can see in this vertical cut, the inferior cornea, you can visualize how thin that cornea is even without measuring it. Uh, with the device, you can just see the cornea and see how it thins and see how it protrudes. So again, very interesting and very useful uh, use of the Schleinflu display. Um, here's the format refractive of another patient with pellucid marginal degeneration. Note the corneal thinning. If you tried to take an ultrasound pachymetry of this patient and measured their cornea at 501 microns, you would think this patient is normal. 
But in fact, this patient has a cornea that's below 400 microns thin. It's just all the way out in the periphery. So again, you really need um, these corneal thickness maps of the whole cornea to really make the proper diagnosis in a patient with significant thinning and significant pellucid marginal degeneration. And here's just the BAD for this pellucid patient. You can see the final D is, uh, again, it's like 10 standard deviations from normal. So it's a very significant advanced case of pellucids. Here's just another example of a patient with pellucids. You see this whole band of inferior thinning all the way down by the limbus. So pellucids usually is fairly uh, 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 symmetrical because of that thinning, again, being by the inferior limbus. And you can see here again, 7.49 standard deviations from normal. So really quite, a, uh, quite obvious. And again, looking at that Schlein fluke image, you can visually see that thinning if you choose the vertical segment. Now we have another patient here. We take a look at this patient. This is very interesting also. Um, you see here again, you have elevation on the front, much more elevation on the back and an extremely thin cornea. So the question is, what is this? And I'll tell you out front, this is not keratoconus, this is not pellucids, but this is the most rare type of ectasia you will see. Um, this is keratoglobus. And you can see the extreme thinning of this cornea. Um, down to 137 microns thin at the thinnest point. Um, again, it's extreme thinning. If you take a look at the Schleimflug image in this, in this patient, you can see the thinning is not a regional thinning of three or four millimeters. It's thinning throughout the whole cornea. And you can actually see this uh, high signal here from this epithelium that's scarring over at the center. So um, congenital keratoglobus is a much more severe and difficult condition to treat, much rarer. But again, another variant that you can diagnose easily with the Panicam. Now we get to our next patient. We take a look at this map, and this map is a little bit more confusing. And if you look at this map at first, you'll look at the anterior elevation. It's very symmetrical, both vertically and horizontally. There's really no islands of elevation of significance. You get to the back of the cornea, and again, it's very symmetrical. You might have some peripheral astigmatism here. I'm not convinced that's an island. Um, it looks really does not look like any ectatic condition that I'm familiar with. The axial map, well, maybe there's a little bit of non-orthogonal to it, a little bit of regular, but again, no significant inferior steepening. And the one note I would take is take a, take a note of how thick this cornea is. Um, it's really very thick. And if we look at the BAD map of this eye, well, the BAD map, the elevation looks totally normal. Um, the final D is actually negative, but there is something very wrong going on here. And if you don't look carefully, this is something that can be missed easily. And the way, what you should be looking at in this map is look at the red line on the pachymetric progression graphs, both graphs. Normally, a cornea will thicken as it goes from its thinnest point all the way out to the limbus. And that's what these black lines represent is two standard deviations of how a cornea should thicken. And in keratoconus and other ectatic diseases, this red line will droop down below the black lines, indicating that the cornea is thinned in the center and thickens excessively fast going to the periphery. But this cornea, the center of the cornea resembles the periphery of the cornea, meaning that the center of the cornea is thickened. And this is a patient with Fuchs dystrophy. And early Fuchs dystrophy can be diagnosed very nicely by looking at the pachymetric progression maps and looking for this flattening of the maps. Um, again, this would warrant uh, getting a cell count, especially if the cornea doesn't display significant guttata. Uh, but if this cornea is flattening out like this and, see, and thickening in the center, it's definitely a sign to call out for a cell count. Now, here's another neat aspect of the Penicam. If you look at the Schlein fluke image, which is the image you see here, you notice that in Fuchs patients, we see two spikes here off to the right. This spike is the endothelium and this spike is the epithelium. And we see in Fuchs patients, they develop epithelial edema, which makes the Schlein fluke image uh, resonate and light up. And we get this reflectance of this uh, swollen epithelium and also this swollen endothelium. And this is a unique sign called the camel sign. This double hump is unique to Fuchs dystrophy. So whenever I see a patient with a flattened PTI or pachymetric progression graph, I immediately go back to the Schleimflug image and look to see if I had this camel sign, another indication of Fuchs dystrophy. So now here's another unusual patient. You look at this map and you say, well, what, what's going on here? If we look at the anterior elevation, we got this island uh, here 
on the front of the cornea, but we look at the back of the cornea and the back of the cornea looks fairly symmetrical. And I really don't see an island formation going on here. The cornea is fairly thick um, and the anterior sagittal axial map definitely shows a strange island of central steepening. So the question is, what is this map? And if we look at the BAD map here, the final D is very normal but we have the front elevation deviation lighting up almost five full standard deviations from normal. So what is this? This is not keratoconus, but what this is is corneal distortion from an RGP contact lens. And this was an RGP contact lens that was fit very steeply on the cornea to try to achieve some multifocality. And when the patient took off this lens, we get this very distorted steepening of the front of the cornea, no change on the back of the cornea, um, and relatively no change in the pachymetric thickness map. So again, this is a case of RGP distortion, not corneal tasia, and we know that from looking at that final D as it's normal, and whenever you see front elevation greater than back elevation, you can rule out ectatic disease. It's something else. It could be a dystrophy, it could be corneal distortion from contact lenses, soft or gas permeable, but it's not ectasia. All right, let's look at our next map here. We take a look at this map and let's start with the anterior elevation. We got kind of this blue island here, but on the back of the cornea, we got this significant elevation, um, which is more than we would normally see. We have significant thinning of the cornea here, and then we got this kind of flattened area here on the axial map and a steeper area here. So what might this be? Let's take a look. Let's go back and take a look. This is a patient post myopic LASIK developing early ectasia. On the back of the cornea after LASIK should appear as it does before LASIK. There should not be an island of elevation. This patient had significant LASIK tissue removal. The front of the cornea still looks fairly normal. Um, it does look like there's some uh, unequal ablation here going on. So this patient may have some astigmatism or some minor loss of best corrected vision, but the really worrisome thing here is this elevation in the back and this patient needs surveillance, I would say, depending on how long ago their refractive surgery was, every every six to 12 months, we would need to check that penicam to make sure that it's not progressing and requiring cross-linking. The penicam can also be used for looking at Visi and ICLs. One of the most important measurements when you're, when you're co-managing the Visian ICL is measuring the, the depth of, of the Visian lens between that and the, and the anterior surface of the crystalline lens. The, the Penicam does a very nice job with its caliper tools of measuring how many microns uh, we have here. In this case here, we have about 280 microns of volt between, the, again, the crystalline lens and the back of the Visian lens. And this is something you want to monitor. You don't want this vault to get down too shallow, below 100 microns, risking rubbing that crystalline lens, causing uh, anterior polar cataract. So again, very useful device to look at that, that Visian ICL implant, making sure, again, that the vault is appropriate as that patient heals. Another extremely useful use of the Panicam is looking for centration of IOLs, whether it's a monofocal IOL or in this case, a, a multifocal um, IOL. Again, the Panicam with its iris camera and retroillumination can easily look, especially once you dilate a patient's pupil, really look at the centration. You can actually measure it with a caliper very nicely of how much decentration you have. Um, with that IOL, whether the bag or, the, or, or is the, whether the lens is uh, tilted in the bag or the bag uh, is losing zonual control. Again, this is a very useful tool for trying to diagnose, especially with multifocal patients, if they're not seeing well, is it due to lens position? And there's a lot of new displays we have on our AXL Wave Panicam. This one's called the Full Sequence Overview Display. And this display uh, gives a lot of information in just one image. We have visual performance of the total eye. We have high order aberrations and we break that down into spherical aberration and coma, the most useful ones that matter. We can, we can uh, focus that on pupil size or on optic zone size. So we can really, uh, depending on what we're doing, we can really look at the high order aberrations in any way that we need. We've got the we low aberrations because the AXL wave is also a uh, excellent um, um, auto refractive. It has a 
biometer and it has a excellent uh, 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 auto refractive device where you get low aberrations, high order aberrations, and again, you can analyze those in all different ways. You get axial length at one view. Um, you also get your corneal thickness, and you can vary this map by pull down to any map that you're most interested in. You get pupil size and dim light, pupil size and bright light, and your retroillumination is just an example of a caudal cataract. And you can see in retroillumination very nicely how that cataracts affecting the patient's vision. Another display we have on our AXO Wave is a vision visual performance display, and this nicely takes the high over high order aberrations of the total eye, and you can separate that um, aberrations from the cornea to the internal. So if a patient is phacic, um, you can, you can uh, take a look at the difference between their total aberrations and their corneal aberrations to determine what's going on in the lenticular. And if, they have, if they're pseudo fake it, then they have an IOL, and you can also tell if the IOL is causing the problem of their visual performance, or is it all due to their cornea? You can see in this particular patient here, in the retroillumination image down below, again, you see that cortical cataract. And this gives you a lot of confidence knowing that this patient is gonna have improved vision taking out that lens, because as we see more and more patients coming in for cataract surgery that has had corneal surgery, sometimes it can be a little challenging to tell is the cataract causing the vision problem or is it their cornea and their corneal surgery that might be contributing to it so the visual display is very useful here's an example of a 65 year old uh, patient with status post myopic lasik and here's a typical post myopic lasik uh, um, a map we see here it's everything looks pretty well we take a look at this patient they have an early cataract it's a pns is a grading system um, the Penicam nuclear staging system, which is a staging system from zero to five. And this gives us a really nice determination of how much opacification is occurring in the crystalline lens. And this doesn't take just a single slice, but it takes an average of all the slices of the lens. So it's a nice way to grade. I find it much more useful than a LOX system. Again, I know my LOX grade two might be like your LOX grade three. So I think this is a much more objective way of watching a cataract and grading a cataract and very useful in clinical practice. And here's that same patient when you look at their visual performance display and you can see here, well, there's really not a lot going on in retroillumination and their internal aberrations look pretty good, but their corneal aberrations, their original LASIK surgery is probably part of the cause of their visual problems. So you, a patient like that, you would not want to promise you're going to make them uh, see a lot clearer with just lens replacement. You might want to plan on doing two procedures, one to clean up the cornea and one to take the lens out. Here's another example of a 61-year-old who glare at night. So glare can be caused by a lot of things. And a 61-year-old, the first thing you think of is, well, maybe they have early cataracts. It's not unusual. But when you see this patient dilated and taking a Penicam, there's really no opacification here at all. You can see there's barely any elevation here on the Schleimflug image. The lens looks clear. But funny here, you see a spike here on the epithelium. And if you take a close look at this patient, this patient had mapped up dystrophy with epithelial edema, and that caused a glare at night was a cornea, not the lens. So it's good not to jump to the to typical conclusion that everything is lenticular in a 60-year-old patient with glare. Just some examples of patients with um, early or no cataracts. This is the PNS score of grade zero. Again, this is again was a 70-year-old patient with a remarkably clear lens. And here's the fellow eye. Again, really no cataracts at all. Here's a patient with a mild PNS grade one, and you can see here in the Schleimflug image, it's starting to elevate, getting past 20%. I find when patients get to grade one and past 20%, they often start to complain of night vision issues, but they may have no loss of best corrected vision just yet, depending on where in the location of the lens you see this opacification. Here's another grade one PNS patient. And as we get to more dense cataracts, we can see here, this is a general nucleosclerotic cataract here, and this is grading as grade two. Um, and here's just a much more dense cataract. This is a, a patient grade three. Remember, the scale goes from zero to five. I'll tell you, it's very rare these days for me to ever see a patient beyond grade three because these patients we encourage to get surgery I mean, as, as soon as possible because of the safety of cataract surgery. And this is one more example of a patient with nucleosclerosis, a grade three cataract. A patient like this would undoubtedly have some loss of best corrected vision. And here's just a pseudophagic patient again. Um, and this patient has a, an IOL in place. But what's interesting about this patient 
actually is the corneal scar they have here from contact lens overwear. This patient was sleeping with a, a, an extended wear lens for an extended period of time, developed a corneal ulcer. So the Schleimflug technology in the Penicam can also be used to look at corneal opacification to watch it as it gets better or worse over time. You can watch it very nicely with the, with the Penicam camera. Here's just an unusual cataract. This is a patient that had a head trauma from a car accident and from an airbag. And uh, over time, they developed this unusual lamellar cataract here, very nicely depicted with the Penicam when you dilate the pupil. And even though this is only a PNS grade of one, this is a patient that had significant night glare and couldn't really drive safely at night anymore. We had to get this cataract taken out. Just another example again of that Vizian ICL, very nice way to measure that uh, vault from the crystalline lens. Here's an interesting patient. This patient was a patient that got hit with a racquetball in their eye and resulted in a subluxation. You can see the zonules here were, were, were torn. And when you dilate the pupil, you see the edge of the crystalline lens. Other displays that are really useful in clinical practice, I find one is called the cataract pre-op display. Even if you're not a cataract surgeon doing cataract surgery, if your patients are having cataract surgery, this display can be really helpful in helping educate your patient. Uh, again, maybe what's the best IOL for a patient like this? So here's an example of a patient. And if you're not familiar with SIMKs and uh, total corneal refractive power, um, these are two different ways of measuring the corneal uh, keratometry. And what we've learned over time is the corneal, total corneal refractive power takes into account not only the front corneal curvature, but the back corneal, corneal curvature also. And many patients have significant back astigmatism on their cornea. And that's why the initial IOL formulas back in the 80s and 90s that only used SIMKs would often have misses, especially with toric IOLs, um, because it would miscalculate the axis and the power of the astigmatism. So what the Penicam does is it measures the traditional SIM case, but also measures the total quality refractive power and then subtracts them and gives you a difference in axis and a difference in astigmatism. And in this patient, the power of the astigmatism really didn't differ much at all. It went from 1.5 to 1.4. So the power selection of the IOL probably wouldn't be problematic. But look at the axis difference. A nine degree difference with a 125 or a 150 cylinder definitely would make a difference. And again, you wanna make sure that the surgeon would be choosing the axis of the total corneal refractive so it takes into account the back of the cornea. So very, very useful device. Another useful number here is cord mu. And again, you may not be familiar with cord mu, but you might be familiar with angle kappa. And cord mu is just a linear conversion of angle kappa. Um, and it's, it's, it's a measurement that tells us how decented the optics are from the pupil. And in this case, when we have a cord mu, especially a cord mu above 0.3, we wanna be very careful about putting any optical element in the eye that requires a precise centration. And those would include most multifocal IOLs. So cord mu is a very useful screening tool. If I see my patient has a large cord mu, I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage them not to get a multifocal IOL, especially since I'm the one that's gonna deal with it after surgery and knowing that there's not a lot you can do when you have a descented multifocal IOL in place uh, to help patients see better. And here's just another example of a cataract pre-op display. And this is a patient with a more irregular cornea and you can see that their cord mu is 0.76. That's the number right down here. Um, this elevated cord mu would be a patient who would definitely not be a great candidate for your typical multifocal IOL and would maybe do better with a monofocal, um, either spherical or, or maybe toric, depending on the situation, IOL. So again, the cataract pre-op display gives us all kinds of useful information. It gives us the PNS score to see how significant the cataract is. It tells us the anterior chamber depth. It tells us the angle. It tells us the horizontal white to white. All in, important numbers when considering lens surgery, um, even if you're considering Vizian surgery, a uh, phacic IOL, all these numbers are really important to make sure the, cornea, the anterior chamber is deep enough, make sure that the optics are, are centered well enough, depending on which IOL you may choose. Another uh, underutilized display on the Penicam is a fast screening report. And I use this in my primary care optometry practice all the time. 
And it's great because once you get used to looking at this report in a very quick glance, it gives you a lot of information. On the top row, it gives you information about the anatomy of the anterior chamber, including anterior chamber angle, uh, depth, and volume. And again, what my eyes go to, my eyes go right to the black lines here. And I want to see this black line to be between the light gray and the white. If it's off to the, to the dark gray, that means it's two standard deviations from normal. Um, when you look at this patient, the top row, everything's white in the center. In the second row, which is, is a pachymetric uh, row, again, everything is within the light gray or white. And the same thing with the second, the third row, K max is a little bit light gray, but nothing goes into the dark gray. And you also in the very bottom, you have a BAD final score, you got your keratometric score and your PNS score. So it gives you a ton of information. Once you train yourself to look at this, you can spend 10 seconds looking at this and, get, and gain, gain valuable information before you even look at that patient or go into the exam lane. So I find this very helpful for me. Here's just another example of a screening report. And the first thing my eyes go to in this patient is this patient has extremely narrow angles. So this is a patient I'm gonna to wanna to inspect very carefully, maybe do gonioscopy, maybe get visual fields, depending on what I see. Again, but the screening report is a great, uh, a great tool to kind of know what kind of patient do I have. Look at the PNS score here, it's a great patient has severe cataracts and a very narrow chamber. So there's, a, there's an outstanding chance that before I even meet and greet this patient, that cataract surgery is probably on the top of my, my mind uh, once I go in and examine the patient clinically. Again, one more screening report here, and you see again another patient with this anterior chamber narrowing. Um, this patient has a borderline BAD score, normal PNS score, so this is probably not a cataract patient, but maybe this is a, a narrow angle or an angle closure risk patient. So again, very helpful to look at. And here's the, the Schleimflug images. This is a patient before and after PI for narrow angles. So this the, the Schleimflug images actually can give you the actual angle um, before and after surgery, this patient went from a 25 degree narrow angle to a little bit better 31 degree open angle. So you got about six degrees of opening after doing the PI in this patient's iris. So again, nice way to monitor the success or the, or the efficacy of your PI procedures. Other things you can see with the Schleinfeld camera, very interesting. This is a patient on top here with intacts. And you can tell if the channels are in the proper location, if the intacts are not extruding or, or perforating the eye. Um, very useful tool. You can look at all different slices of the cornea. Down here below, another interesting image. Um, this is a decimate stripping uh, endothelial keratoplasty DMAC. And again, you can really see the corneal transplant tissue very nicely on these scans. All right, another display of pre-op cataract. Again, you can get all this different information. Here's another patient where, um, again, their corneal density is lighting up red. So the nice thing about the Pentacam is almost all of the different metrics will light up yellow or red if there are two or three standard deviations from normal. So at a very quick glance here, it brings your eye, like for this, I'll look at the two red measurements and the yellow measurement first, just to see what is significant and what is not significant. The other wonderful thing that the AXO wave can do, it can do scleral prophylometry. And if you fit scleral lenses, scleral prophylometry has changed the way I fit scleral lenses. This is the original scleral profile on the original Pentacam basic, the, the five shot. But what this shows us here is this a patient with a perfectly spherical cornea, but with an extremely toric periphery. And historically before it had prophylometry, this would be a patient that I would probably put three, four scleral lenses on, trial lenses on, trying to find a good fit. Um, and because I can't see the toricity of the sclera with a slit lamp usefully, the only way to see that is by putting trial lenses on and trial lenses and trying to get a good fit. And without going to a toric haptic, this patient is gonna have problems, they're gonna have bubbles, they're gonna have late day fogging. So knowing this right out of the gate is gonna make me wanna to go to a, a lens that already has a toric haptic or maybe even a freeform lens that I can really specifically design. So scleral prophylometry has been really key to help streamline and, um, and, uh, and, and get my contact lens practice in scleral lenses efficient and cost effective. So now I can get patients done in one or two lenses instead of three or four lenses. Patients have more confidence when that first lens you order and they put in their eye, they can walk out and wear right away and scleroprophilometry has made a huge difference. Um, here's another patient. Again, if you look at the difference in their scleroprophilometry, 
you got minus 140 microns here at 12 o'clock. And then if you look at nine o'clock here, you got plus 125. So there's almost a 300 micron difference. And I have found in my hands that when I have anything over 150 micron difference, I start going immediately to a uh, toric haptic or a freeform haptic. This patient does have some astigmatism on their cornea, but that's not nearly as important. I can tell that with any topography or tomography. What I can't tell is, is their architecture of the of the sclera, which is really helpful in streamlining. And here's just another case of a patient that has a spherical sclera. If you look at the sclera, it's virtually the same all the way around. This is a patient that does not require free forms haptic or even a toric haptic, and I can do really fine with a standard lens. And again, this will save my patient money because charging them for a freeform lens design is going to be a lot more work for me and a lot more cost for the patient. So it really helps me get the best lens on their eye and get closer to first lens success. And that's really the key. Here's just another patient with a lot of scleral tericity. Again, a, a patient with keratoconus and with a toric, with toric sclera. Again, very helpful here. Now, here's the newest version of our scleral profilometry that's available today on our AXL Wave Penicam, and it's called CSP Pro. And the difference between this and our older version here, our older version required five different scans, a superior, inferior, central, temporal, and nasal scan stitched together. So it quite, took some time. It took maybe 10 or 15 minutes sometimes to get all the scans and stitch them together. Today, with the CSP Pro, we can get many eyes in one single scan and get a full uh, coverage of 16 or more millimeters, um, sometimes uh, as much as 18 or 20 millimeters of coverage in one single scan. Sometimes, as in this patient, we did miss a little bit of the superior lid. So this blue is a second scan that I just stitched in and added on because some of the superior lid was missing on that first scan. So I took the initial scan, I had about 95%, but I wanted 100% of data to design my lens. And so I took a second scan and stitched it together. But now with the CSP Pro, it's not unusual that I can take these scans in five minutes. I mean, it's, it's really a tremendous time saver um, for the patient, for my technicians. It's made fitting scleral lenses so much more fun and so much more cost effective too for my practice. Now let's look at another uh, interesting map that we have here. Um, this map here, if you look at, there's again, this is flattening in the center on the anterior. On the back, it looks pretty normal. You see the symmetry when you compare left to right and up to bottom, top to bottom, pretty symmetrical. Um, you see again, this flattening in the center here and thinning of the, of the corneal thickness map. And if we do a difference map, this is a patient that had LASIK surgery. And if, we, and if we do a difference map, it's very important when patients have problems optically after LASIK surgery to assess certain things. Number one, you wanna make sure they don't have ectasia. Number two, you wanna make sure that the ablation was applied centrally to the eye. So the best way to determine LASIK centration or ectasia is to do what's called a difference map. We call it a compare to map. And as you see here, this is the post LASIK tangential curvature front map. This is the pre-LASIK front tangential curvature map. And on the right here is your difference map. And you can see here the outline of the ablation. It's a nice well-centered myopic ablation. So we can rule out the centered ablation as a cause for any of the visual problems the patient may have. We can also look at the elevation map instead of the tangential map. Also assures us that this cornea, front cornea here, the ablation pattern is well-centered over the pupil. So again, a nice result here. And we can also look at the corneal thickness difference map. If we wanna see, let's say the patients came back post-operatively after LASIK, they were minus three, and now a month later, they're minus one. So you wanna say, did my laser really take away the right amount of tissue? I can do a difference map with the corneal thickness profile, and I can see exactly how many microns of tissue was removed, and if that makes sense, and how many doctors that we tried to treat to see if the patient has been undertreated or even maybe overtreated. And if you're looking for a tasia, the best thing you can do is do a difference map with the back elevation. Um, and you see here, this again is the pre-LASIK uh, surgery back elevation map. This is the post-surgery back elevation map. Notice that the best fit sphere on the back, the pre and post map match each other. That's very important when you look at the difference maps and when you're doing back and front elevation maps. And you'll see here, there's really no area 
um, centrally island of elevation. So there's really no significant ectasia going on here. So I feel pretty confident that if there's patients having a visual problem or they have residual astigmatism, that it's not likely due to a weakened cornea or corneal ectasia. So that's all the slides I have for tonight. Uh, Michelle, do we have any questions from the audience? I do, and I just uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tulo, for that great presentation. I did want to remind the audience that on your GoToWebinar screen, there is a text box where you can enter any questions you may have. If you miss part of the webinar or if there's anything you want to go back and review, you will receive a link to this recording within the next week. All right, here's your next question, or your first question. Uh, when using the ABCD display, how do you decide which population you're going to use, the green or the red population? That's a really good question, and I would tell you a lot of people do not understand what that is. So the way I consider it, there are three gates. There's the green gates, there's the red gates, and the blue gates. The green gates I use, it's a normative population database. I use that when I don't have a confirmed diagnosis of keratoconus. So if I'm looking at an eye and I haven't decided that this is keratoconus, maybe it's a very early change in their cornea, that's when I use the green maps. If I've determined the patient has keratoconus and now I'm watching them for progression, I then use the red gates. If a patient has cross-linking subsequently done, then I use only the blue gates. So that's kind of my, my mental rubric that I use. No diagnosis, green gates, confirmed diagnosis, red gates, cro post-cross-linking, blue gates. Thank you. What are the top three benefits the Penicam brings to your patient care? Wow. Um, for me, top three. Uh, number one for me, and that's and, and, and this is a, a newer application, I would say in the last two years, it has taken my orthokeratology practice and it's exploded. It's made my first lens success go from 3.2 lenses down to 1.2 lenses. So I can fit most of my orthokeratology patients in a single lens. And I now no, don't tolerate residual astigmatism in my orthokeratology patients because I can fit freeform lenses and not only get rid of their myopia, but get rid of their astigmatism predictably. So for me, um, especially financially, um, yeah, the Penicam biggest impact has been in my ortho-K practice in the lens design um, and in just monitoring my ortho-K patients over time. Number two is probably my scleral lens population. Um, and then number three would be just as a screening tool and to uh, speed up the process of getting patients in my chair and focusing on a problem such as a cataract or a narrow angle, things like that. So it's really become, it's gone from a device that I order a Penicam for a patient to now being used since I can, they can, my technicians can scan a, a patient with a Penicam during the pre-op in less than two minutes. Um, so when I'm not doing the full CSP scan and doing a, just an ordinary Penicam scan, which gives you all the displays we just discussed, it really takes two minutes to do that. So it doesn't add significant time to my pre-op testing. And since it gives me an auto refraction, it gives me high order aberrations. I get so much information from it. Is since the last two years when I've integrated in, into my general purpose screening, um, it's really saved me a lot of time and it really helped me identify cataracts a lot sooner um, and, and visual complaints correlating with specific problems either in the cornea or in the lens. So those are the three areas for me personally that it's made the biggest impact. Thank you. Does the cord mu change after cataract surgery? So, um, well, that's a good question. It shouldn't. Um, the cord mu is dependent upon the architecture of the cornea. And yes, cataract surgery does do clear cornea incisions for the most, most part of most modern surgeries. But in general, it doesn't change significantly after pre and post uh, cataract surgery. Um, it's really most important pre-surgery as a screening tool. Again, if you're putting an advanced optic lens in, or if you have a patient that may have a, a weak capsule where the lens won't center well, you expect them to have a floppy iris or something like that. Any complex case, looking at cord mu, I think is really important. And it may result in simplifying which IOL you put in because the only thing worse than a, than a, a, a bad IOL is a bad decentered IOL. Um, so cord mu is very helpful in that sense. Thank you. 
If keratoconus isn't conclusive on the bad display, what can I do to rule out uh, or rule in or out the diagnosis? Um, well, I think you need to look at, at, at change over time. You need to look at left eye versus right eye. Keratoconus is an asymmetric disease. A lot of scans, I get sent scans um, every day, every week. People send me scans to look at. One of the things I always look at, I always make sure I compare right and left eye. One of the things that we know is when you look at the thinnest point of the right and left eye, if there's a greater difference of 17 microns, it's very suspicious. If it's greater than 25 microns, it's abnormal. So looking for that asymmetry, when the corneas are symmetric and you have, say, two doctors with astigmatism in both eyes and the thinnest point in both eyes are the same and corneas are the same thickness overall, that's typically not keratoconus, even if it's a regular astigmatism. Um, so you can look at the, look at the uh, comparing the fellow eyes and comparing scans over time. We know that keratoconus always either stabilizes or gets worse, where things like contact lens distortion, which can be uh, a red herring and sometimes look like keratoconus, um, once you remove the lenses, it either gets better or stays the same. So, so uh, differentiating other conditions like dystrophies and everything, um, it's important, again, to look at the architecture of how that cornea from its thinnest point thickens going outwards, and that usually tells the story. All right. Thank you for that great question and answer session, Dr. Tulo. Uh, thank you for uh, everyone for joining us this evening and for everyone who submitted questions as well. Uh, Dr. Tulo, are there any final thoughts you would like to leave the audience with? Uh, no, I just thank everyone for joining this webinar. I have my email address, uh, as you can see here, btulo at oculususa.com. Happy to answer any questions you have about anything about the Pentacam or any other Oculus technologies. And thank you very much, Michelle, for, for hosting tonight. And everyone have a great evening. Yeah, this concludes the presentation. And on behalf of Oculus, good night, everyone. Thank you.